So here's what we're doing. We're going to be, I'm going to be talking about stream processing options and some high level about uh, streaming frameworks, a lot of kind of the, the tools and APIs you can use, um, but I'll kind of ease us into that just a little bit here. Once I'm done talking about that and sort of throwing some ideas out there without really giving you like a demo and a deep dive into any of these tonight, uh, we're going to open it up for people to say, oh, I've worked with this framework that you mentioned and it was great. I worked with this one and it was terrible. Um, maybe even just, just sharing your real life, whatever you're doing right now, if you're doing streaming so that we can kind of hear, okay, people are using this and maybe ask a few questions without drilling anyone like it's a job interview. That's the idea. Okay. So, um, if you want my contact information, I'm pretty easy to find on LinkedIn's probably where I, you will see more posts than anything else. Just look for Dustin Vanoy. You should be able to find it. I also have YouTube videos going on right now. So if you do go check those out, I've got a little bit of, of demos on spark streaming and, uh, one random case SQL, uh, example out there on YouTube that I'm hoping to add to as, as time, uh, opens up maybe in the future. So the agenda tonight is pretty quickly in the next 20 minutes here, talk about shifting to streaming, why it's important and all that, what Kafka is, because everything I talk about will be somewhat assuming that we're going to use Kafka, but I'll try and call out if it's like a Kafka only tool or something else. We'll talk about some streaming frameworks and then I'll open it up for group discussion, feedback, that kind of thing. So shifting to streaming, basically what I want you to think about if, especially if you're brand new to the idea of streaming, which um, some of us still might be, uh, is that if you haven't started yet, if your organization hasn't started yet, I think you will soon. Now I've said that a couple of years now, so, um, by soon that's kind of relative, but I do think organizations are really starting to at least prototype streaming and trying to see how they can get more real time. And the reason for this is that life's not really a batch, right? Things are happening all the time. We can react to them. Our applications are able to do a lot more for, for customers, a lot more of, of our uh, services and offerings are kind of an online experience. And so if you think of recommendation systems as you're shopping Amazon or checking out Netflix, the quicker we can get you some changes and, and redirect you to exactly what you're looking for, the more likely you are to stick with us and enjoy your experience. So that's that's basically the idea of why streaming, um, to, to nail in it a little more, um, we, we had a lot of time where at least me, maybe not you, but at least me as a data engineer for many years, I kind of would say, you know what, you don't really only need batch. We can run this stuff once a day and you'll be fine. Or we can, okay, we'll be really kind and we'll run this every hour and update it every hour. That's the most you need. You don't need things down to the minute or sometimes even less than the minute. Um, it's, it's all kind of too expensive and too hard. We don't need to do that. And I think we're, we're beyond that time, quite frankly. It doesn't mean that every single thing we do will be streaming, but our customers and our business leaders know that the successful organizations are doing things in real time. They are doing things like stream processing. And um, it's important to call out the difficulties and the extra you know, learning curve for the team, but it's important to also not say, nope, not possible. Nope, we can't do it. Uh, I think that's a very bad approach going forward. You should be looking at Let's do an experiment. Let's also figure out how much it's gonna to cost to run this all the time versus 15 minute intervals, hour intervals, that can make a huge difference in your architecture and your cost. So one of the things I, I like to think about, and this is certainly arguable, is, is streaming ingestion easier. And for a while I'd always say, no, it's a lot harder. Now I'm at the point where I'd say, well, you know what? Working with large data sets all at once uh, is really not that easy either. We just got really used to it. At least I got really used to it. And so the idea of having a two hour job that runs in the middle of the night, and if it fails, it wakes me up and I fix it. That, that kind of seems easy because I did it for many years, but, um, there, there's something different about thinking about your logic, either one record at a time and a true like event based system or a small batch at a time, which is, which is some of the systems I'll talk about today. And so, um, it's really, really nice. Even if you aren't ready to like do analytics and real time feedback to your users in like a web application, it's really nice to start ingesting data in a streaming fashion so that when you need to make more use of it, do some, you know, data science and, uh, you know, other types of real time analytics, potentially you've already got part of that processing happening in real time. And that also means when someone goes and clicks refresh on a, on a report that hits a database, even if even if we're not going to wire that up to automatically refresh every second or minute or something for them, we still know that they're getting up-to-date data and they're not seeing yesterday's data. And 
forgive me looking over to see if anyone's joining the session. Looks like we're good. I think I got everyone in so far. So uh, one of the keys that you'll hear a lot uh, if you talk to me about streaming, and quite frankly, if you talk to a lot of data engineers, is Apache Kafka. So I want to make sure we know why we use Kafka. Uh, and basically, the, the way I look at it is we need a reliable place to stream events that's decoupled from the destination. So point being, if I have uh, a certain part of my website, like maybe a user signup experience, I don't want to be the analytics system to be connected directly to that. I don't want to have to send the data, make sure they get it before I move on and call the, the user creation a success. I want to send it somewhere, get the acknowledgement that it's there, we're good, and move on. And if the analytics team, if another service within my organization needs that information, they can go get it separate from my processing in my application. So that's a lot of the idea to it. Producers can publish and move on while the data is persisted for other consumers to go get. And so what that kind of looks like is if you have input sources of like trip data and vendor data, that goes to Apache Kafka or Azure Event Hubs or Amazon Kinesis or Google Cloud PubSub. These are all similar concepts for tonight's, for tonight's discussion. We'll just assume they're all basically working like I'll describe Apache Kafka. And then different consumers can pull from that same place, that same uh, topic, that same space, that same table within uh, some type of Kafka broker, Azure Event Hub, et cetera. Um, the way Kafka works, we're going to go through this quick, and there's a link at the end to help you read the very long post that's really good by Jay Krebs. Basically, Kafka takes the approach that everything's a distributed log, or that they Kafka is a distributed log and everything is just an event in the log. And so if you think of, if you worked with databases a lot, you can kind of reconstruct the database table from the log. Kafka is kind of serving as that log for multiple consumers to take the data, keep things up to, up to date and take action as needed. As you look at a Kafka topic, um, it gets partitioned. Really, as we start talking about big data, partitioning is almost always key. Uh, Kafka does scale horizontally across uh, nodes in a cluster. Um, some of those kinds of things you expect from big data systems. So let's start getting into some of the frameworks. I'm going to start with the one I know the best, and I won't I won't spend too much time on it. How are we doing on time so far? I won't spend too much time on this one just because I, I use it and like it. But Apache Spark structured streaming is one framework for for building structured streaming or for building streaming jobs, whether they're stateful or stateless. Um, it's basically built to be a a fast fault tolerant. Um, stream processing engine. And most things I talk about tonight are, will probably say they're fast. They'll probably say they're fault tolerant. They might talk about, you know, um, being able to handle like back pressure and things like that. I think they all do a pretty good job of it from what I've heard and what I know. Um, but Spark, Spark is one of those that touts that, right? So one of the things I like about Spark, the reason I would use Spark on a lot of projects is that it's got a batch and a streaming framework that are pretty interchangeable. You can build some common transformations for your data, but have the job run separately for your maybe historical batch uh, load and then switch over to streaming or or have some sort of cutoff to streaming at, at the time that you're ready to go more real time, more near, near term type stuff. Um, and it has a super large community, which I don't think I put on another slide for you, but uh, Spark, there's a lot of jobs open. There's a lot of people that are Spark developers. And so it's a really good spot to be if you're trying to learn a streaming distributed system type of processing language. Spark is a good place to start because of all the resources available. Um, I think I want to keep moving. So we have plenty of time for you all to give feedback and talk about other, other things that I left out. But um, if you want to know more about the kind of ideas behind Spark Structured Streaming, this link, which is uh, TD uh, talking quite a few years back about Spark Structured Streaming is really good to understand kind of where they came from when they built it. So I won't do this for every single one, but I've got kind of simple examples for, for Spark. So we'll start simple. To read in data through a stream in Spark, it's like you get the Spark context. We'll see Flink has a context. Uh, I'm not sure if all of them have a context, but quite a few of these types of frameworks have that. You take your Spark context, you call read stream, you give it some kind of format. So there's a lot of different connectors that you can switch in um, to hit different source systems. And that's gonna be true of most of these uh, tools I'll talk about. Provide configurations and hit load. And now you've got data coming in as a stream. To write, it looks a little similar, write stream. You have some options, some format, checkpointing or some way of saving uh, where you're at in your processing. What's the last Kafka record you, you've read and consumed. 
those types of things will be uh, a, a key term and checkpoint isn't always a term for it, but we'll see that across all systems. And uh, you can do group by, and I really just wanted to kind of highlight the fact that uh, windowing becomes really important when you're doing streaming. If you're doing any type of aggregation, you kind of need to define, I'm not looking necessarily at all time. I'm looking at the last 30 minutes, the last hour, the last day, and trying to recalculate things at that, that type of window. And there's various ways you can set up these windows. Um, it's the terminology will change just a little bit as you switch from one language to another, one framework to another. So Apache Spark Structured Streaming. Um, one of the things people don't like about it, I should say, is that uh, they, they very for a very long time and maybe to, to an extent still uh, have this mindset of like, everything's a batch. We can just make really small batches. We can do micro batches. And quite honestly, for the types of projects I'm on, that works fine. It hasn't been a, a problem very often, um, but I'll, I'll talk, talk about some of these that are streaming first and Confluence, one of these that's very much streaming first and it's very much tied to Kafka. So Confluent has a whole data platform. There's open source versions and then there's the, the Confluent vendor supported versions that you, you pay extra for licensing or use Confluent Cloud. But KSQL DB, Kafka Streams and Kafka Connect are three really key players that Confluent has that, that really do work well with Kafka. And so uh, what's great about Confluent is it's an easy way to run and monitor Kafka, especially if you if the cost works out and you can do Kafka uh, Confluent Cloud, you've got this environment, you don't really manage too much. You've got the experts that have built and manage a lot of Kafka uh, doing this for you. Let me pause and hook up another camera just in case you really wanna see my face here. So what I was kind of getting at was Confluent is a um, easy way to run Kafka, but they've also got really good tools for working with Kafka. So the downside of Confluent, just to call it out at the start, is if you aren't pushing the data through Kafka, if you have no desire to put all of your data through Kafka, um, I believe you don't really, uh, or some other similar, you know, broker um, hub type of system, I, I think a lot of these things aren't going to work for you. So if you're going through Kafka for everything anyway, which is a very valid architecture to do, KSQL DB is a nice stateful streaming um, way. It's kind of, it's actually Kafka streams in the back end, but you can use a SQL language and uh, easily work with, kind of easily, right? Like none, none of this is that easy, but you can kind of easily work with uh, streaming data that way. Uh, Kafka streams is a little more full-blown Java API. And if you're wanting to like build the streaming processing into another application, especially a Java application, of course, then uh, it's kind of a, you can start off pretty lightweight deploying a Kafka streams application or two that that share a few properties to, to kind of distribute the work basically to run as multiple consumers on the same data. Uh, and so Kafka streams can be really powerful. Uh, I'm not uh, as in love with the API for that one, but I also haven't spent a lot of time going deep on it. KSQL DB, I really like, you know, it's kind of fun to work with because it's a SQL type language. And you can do a lot with just a few statements. And then Kafka Connect is very simple, but powerful. So if I wanna replicate from a database into Kafka or from Kafka into my cloud storage environment, there's Kafka Connect connectors for all of that. And if you're using Confluent Cloud, some of them you can run just in, in the cloud, just pay the money and they'll, they'll run it for you. Others, you basically just spin up a Docker image or a, a virtual machine or something and run your connectors that way. So if you just need to replicate data from Kafka or to Kafka, you should definitely check out Kafka Connect regardless of other streaming environments. Okay, I don't know how valuable it's gonna be, but I'm gonna show a few code samples as we go. So this one's a little easier to read for a lot of us, I'm guessing this is just, here's what KSQL looks like. In this case, we're creating a new stream off of existing streams where we have a select statement. And so we're defining some information about a topic in the with clause. And then we basically are saying select title and aggregate. And in this case, we didn't provide any windowing, any uh, grace period, some of the things that you actually are going to wanna to think about in most cases. But this is going to basically set up stateful streaming and aggregation for you with this simple of a command. Okay, on the Kafka stream side, this is, I don't, this might be the same example. Like, I can't remember if I just switched uh, between K streams and KSQL, which is the, the right way to do it to make this easy for you. But basically, this is just kind of a glimpse at what it would look like. So it's not crazy. For someone that likes Apache Spark, I can't really, you know, say that it's not a fine API to work with. Um, I'm just more comfortable with Apache Spark and, and have used that a lot more. So Confluent, very good option if you're gonna use Kafka and stream a lot. And then Apache Flink is another um, kind of, it's been around a long time for streaming, it's pretty popular. 
I, I'd say if you think about most stuff I'd say about Apache Spark, I, I don't disagree with that stuff for Apache Flink from the stories I've heard, the people I've talked to. The APIs are similar. There's some different options for using more of a table or SQL API. Let me jump to this slide where I call out a, just a couple things. Um, I don't really know how to compare Flink and Spark that much because they're both really good, except the Spark community, I believe, is quite, quite a bit bigger. Um, the amount of jobs I see that require Apache Spark is definitely higher. So if you're looking for marketable skills, I think Apache Spark's uh, kind of got a leg up there. But I will say um, that uh, I may have called this out earlier. Flink kind of has more of that everything's a stream, right? So Apache Spark for a long time has been everything's a batch. We'll just run batches really small, micro batches, and that'll be our streaming platform. Apache Flink started off as streaming and they say you either have an unbounded stream, which is streaming the way I think about it, or you have a bounded stream, which is batch mode. You're saying, hey, I'm gonna take the data from this point to this point and process it all at once. Um, these examples come, I have the YouTube link there, uh, the, and you can see their copyright in the bottom to make sure you know who it is. So Ver Verica, I think it is one of the uh, really, um, I think one of the creators, definitely a very, very strong contributor to Apache Flink, created these videos and they're, and they're pretty good. I didn't go through all of them, of course, but they're pretty good. So here's a look at the API. And if you've used Spark, if you looked very closely at my Kafka streams one, you can see some similarities. You talk about like sources, talk about syncs. We just did read stream and write stream in Spark, similar ideas. Uh, and then these transformations are a little bit low level in the data stream API. I think there's a lot more to the table API than this slide will show you, but I did grab from his training the uh, example of uh, using SQL to work with Apache Flink. And so Spark also has SQL. I didn't really um, hone in on that, but you may have heard that in the past. So pretty much the frameworks we'll talk about have SQL options and you can usually do quite a bit with SQL, but not everything. You'll find yourself jumping into other APIs at some point. Okay, uh, we don't have too much more before we go into open discussion. So let me stick with this for another three, three to four minutes here, okay? We have Apache Beam or Dataflow. So Google Google kind of snuck into my list of frameworks that, that I know companies are using and, and using quite a bit um, because Google Cloud Dataflow uses the Apache Beam APIs. They op Google open sourced this quite a while ago now, but Apache Beam runs outside of Google Cloud. It can run on Apache Spark, Apache Flink, SAMHSA, um, probably some others too, but those are the ones that stand out in my head. And so, um, one of the things I've heard people really like about Apache Beam is that you can have one API and execute it on, on different environments. And so you can write code in Java, Python, or Scala. You can run it serverless if you're in the Google Cloud environment. And I've seen that work pretty well. I've seen the way it scales and things. Um, there are some things that I that I, I would need to dig in more if I was doing it all the time to make sure uh, I don't, you know, cap my resources and have trouble. I saw a little bit of that too when running in production, but uh, it's pretty powerful to run serverless on Google Cloud Dataflow. But if I'm in an enterprise where one team's doing Flink, one's doing Spark, um, and we want to start to kind of move closer and closer together with how we write our code, Apache Beam is supposed to be able to come in and, and be that API that then can run in those different environments as you kind of shift your operations and things. Uh, I won't harp on this. There was a really good session. I don't think the public link is available yet. A really good session at... Um, Kafka Summit, which is happening right now, and uh, or sorry, just finished uh, yesterday, I believe. And they kind of call out the architecture, not a whole lot to call out here because all of these have some sort of architecture that, um, you know, is, is good to know if you're gonna go deep with it. But um, basically what I wanna call out is that you can use these different resources on Google Cloud, run in a distributed manner without worrying about it. And then this is just to show you that the, when I had pictures of graphs that are just come with the tool, which if you're running in Google Cloud, the graph graphical interface to monitor and see what's going on and track counts and things, that comes with the tool, which is really cool. I don't know if there's something, if you're running locally, I would have to, I, I didn't think to check on that one, but if someone else knows, let us know in the chat. This is super tiny because they have a lot of comments. So this is using um, Apache Beam API, right? I think that, yeah, this is Apache Beam API. And um, this is just a word count. So there's actually not a lot of code in this, but uh, if I get to share these slides, you can you can zoom in on that and see what's worthwhile. This is the Python version of Apache Beam. And I think it's just a simple word count again, maybe with a little bit more transformation than the other. And yeah, so the, the terminology is a little different. Um, 
the the par do and things like that is uh, it's it's different, but I think once you wrote a couple applications, you'd probably catch on pretty quickly. All right, uh, Apache NiFi is a UI driven one, and I I think that's why it's popular. I think that's why I've seen people using it for streaming, though it does certainly do batch, is because of the UI focus of it. But uh, other things I saw that that are claimed about why it's good, or that it's um, this flow based programming model. So if you think of like a directed acyclic graph like you would do in Airflow. I think it's kind of that idea of data flow management, but you can actually run it streaming and um, and things all within the NiFi platform and using a UI to build all or most everything. So it's open source and extendable, which is always nice when you can extend it as needed. And then the data buffering and back pressure, what I've heard about that sounds, sounds really good. I don't know that it's not covered in the other tools, but it's something that is, is easily missed if there's a tool that's like this UI ETL tool that claims real time. A lot of times they miss handling as things get behind and uh, trying to keep up with the work with the overall load and and scaling as well, which knife I can handle. So a couple of glimpses of the UI from a training video I'll put in my notes or in my reference list. So there is um, adding a processor. There's a huge list that you search through and they just grab Kinesis Firehose. You connect some different processes this way in the NiFi editor. And that's all I got for you on NiFi right now. Samza, I, I have trouble kind of calling this out as different from the others. I almost put it in my kind of legacy stuff, but I, I still think it's it's used at the places it's used. I think it's improved a lot, even just within the last, uh, maybe it's been a few years now, but when they went to the 1.0 API, it improved quite a bit. It became a lot more easy to use and they made it Beam compatible, which means there's probably a decent amount of people that are using Apache Beam and running on Samza. Um, it seems to me, unless this has changed more recently, that it's typically going to be run on Yarn and it's going to use Kafka for a lot of management. So it's if you're running Yarn in Kafka, especially if you have like Hadoop workloads from that, you, that you're running, then I think it may fit a little bit better. But it's, it's meant to work in a lot of different environments too, like, like most of these. There's options out there. Um, but one of the links I had was very much calling that yarn is still kind of where all of the features you want are there. It does have a SQL API, by the way, I don't think I have an example here. So here's kind of a glimpse at using SAMSA API. I think that's just kind of setting up the descriptor, not quite as much. And then here's a little bit of the core uh, apply method. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time trying to understand this code as we go. Um, kind of the last bit here is that we have some 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 of the originals have been around a while and storm i don't think is officially deprecated i don't know how heavily used it is it's not really where i would expect to start new projects so i'm not going to spend time on it apex i think was the one that is deprecated um and or or not maintained or <laughs> some term within apache that that tells me it's probably not going to have the new features i want in the future uh, and then flume is something that uh, i believe is still an option if you're using uh, yarn and hadoop especially Really good for simple like um, streaming scenarios, not for a lot of transformation, at least the last time I looked at it, which has been quite a few years since I've talked to anyone about Flume. Uh, some cloud specific ones are always worth looking into. So if you have a bunch of stuff on Amazon, look at Kinesis Streams. If you have a bunch of stuff on Azure, look at Stream Analytics, which is a very SQL focused way of doing streaming. And then um, Google has, obviously Google Cloud Dataflow I talked about is kind of their main heavy hitter. Google data stream look like, to me, it looked like it's more of a replication type of piece. And so it might be a piece to the puzzle to consider as well. And I'm sure I missed some things. Um, honorable mentions, I was gonna add to this list. Maybe we'll add to it as you all are telling me what you've used and experienced in the past. Stream sets, I haven't heard about it in a little bit now, but when I've heard about it, people liked it. And some of the others I almost put on the list, I, I held back because I, I've, I've only heard marketing people and salespeople talk about it. So I didn't wanna act like it's being used by data engineers out there. All right. I don't think I have any final thoughts. I think I have a final question. So um, a few references are, are, are here for you if you want to screenshot this real quick, but I will try and get this posted to our Slack group. And uh, if the recording turns out well, I'll, I'll chop up the parts where my video cut out and, and get that posted. And thank you. You can always reach out to me. Um, but let's go into some group discussion here. So I'll stop my share. And you can unmute, you can type in chat, but I think basically what I wanna ask is, um, well, we'll start with any any frameworks that I did mention that someone's worked with and wants to add something about why you thought it was awesome or why you did not like it and will never use it again. Any, any of those kinds of uh, examples are always helpful for us. I, 
Yeah, I, I can talk very briefly. So I thought Kinesis was something I was hoping to see on that list, uh, something we use uh, as a streaming ecosystem. It just kind of fits in nicely with all other AWS stuff and it's just easy to get onboarded. And of course, Kinesis with the Spark in combination also kind of plays well uh, if, if you put it on EMR sort of combination. So just uh, that's that's one use case we use at the moment. Uh, so I just thought of. Yeah, so Kinesis, when I hear Kinesis, I think of the piece that works a lot like Kafka. It's kind of the the broker that that's collecting the data and, and you're using. Do you also use, uh, I think Kinesis, Kinesis Streams is what I've heard of, and also Kinesis Firehose. Do you use some of those capabilities that are tied to Kinesis, or is it all Spark for the actual processing of the data? At this point, we use Spark for all the processing okay. side of it. We use a stream as just more like a queue, you can say. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, Kinesis, PubSub, and uh, Azure Event Hubs are all likely yeah. to be your replacement for Kafka if you're really cloud-focused running over there. Um, there's there's reasons people say not to use them, but I don't I don't have any blanket reasons. I'd say pick Kafka over those. I walk around calling it Kafka regardless of what it is, though. So that's kind of my I can't quite adjust to calling it Kinesis. I'm just like, yeah, we're working with Kafka, and then every once in a while, it's a uh, oh wait, it doesn't do that exactly the way Kafka does. So cool, yeah. Thanks for sharing. Other thoughts of things I things I included or, or left out that people want to share about. Let me get to these chat messages we had to. Hi, this is Ravi. Sorry, I dropped out and rejoined. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear. Sorry, I tried to let you back in as soon as I could, but then I was having trouble <laughs> okay. doing that as I no, shared. So I welcome back. Up. I was driving. That's why I was muted. You know, I was chatting instead of a thing. So, um, uh, I, and I don't know if you had it on your list, but there's something going on because uh, I, I did go to... Um, the Kafka Summit this week, the past, I think it was like Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, so I did go to that because I am get, I'm a mess, I have a messaging background. Um, it's kind of the, like the rabbit MQ type of products. Um, and it's been difficult to get into streaming because they're not quite the same. They're not, they're considered different, um, I guess, uh, pro uh, uh, projects, but uh, different uh, mechanisms, I guess, for lack of a better, I can't think of the word right now. Um, so to do like streaming and messaging has been kind of difficult. Um, but one of the things I found is um, another company that makes their own Kafka product, apart from Confluent, is IBM. Uh, they have a product called Event Streams. And in the past, last month, they did something really weird where they were going to get rid of streams that their own products, their Event Streams product, and just contract with Confluent as part of their whole cloud pack integration thing. And then they reverted. Um, but they were actually, um, they're actually part of that. Um, but but um, the reason why I bring that up because I, I do have a messaging background on the IBM product. Um, and one, one other thing, I don't know if you mentioned this, is um, Apache Pulsar, which actually combines um, which combines streaming and mess. So I don't know if you've heard of something called Apache Pulsar, um, or if that was on your list of streaming products. You know, um, so there's actually two vendors of. But I was just gonna say Pulsar. I should have put Pulsar in the list of like um, like Kafka things. So yeah, I kind of uh, and I sorry if the the description for the event was a little uh, ha haphazard. I. We, we thought we had someone speak in this month and they, they weren't able to yet. So um, yeah, I didn't talk too much about what are like the competitors to Kafka, but Pulsar is certainly one of them and uh, it works quite a bit different. So I think if you're, you know, at that point where you're choosing your, your distributed log or your, you know, your broker for this type of thing, Pulsar is worth the, worth the look. I, they haven't, as far as I could tell, they haven't really gained in popularity and um, as much as I thought they would when I first heard about them, because it, it, seems pretty good and it, it does some things quite different than Kafka that I thought some people would jump onto, but I, I don't hear it talked about nearly as much and maybe it's just the bubble I'm in. Uh, we don't talk about, it. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, in there, I only discovered it three weeks ago, I think it was. Um, and the reason I got interested is because one, there's one company. Can you hear me? I can again. Yeah. Let's, let's go, go a little bit more. We'll see if we can get the end of this and then we'll jump into something else. Go ahead. 
Okay, yeah. So there was a two companies looking at the reason I got involved in it was first data stacks is coming out has come out with their own version of it in the cloud um, of, of Apache Pulsar. So they're competing. Um, and then I found another company called Stream Native uh, that's um, that was um, that was doing it before them, before data stacks. And uh, they were acquired by Splunk. So now my ears are kind of, because when I heard those two things, like my ears kind of perked up and said, yeah, let me take a look at Apache Pulsar um, and take it seriously. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely one of the, the players in the uh, open source community for, for that type of thing, yeah. Okay, anyone else? What else did I miss or any other thoughts on streaming frameworks or uh, Kafka competitors or things like that. So did you have Spark streaming on the list or? Yeah, I had Spark streaming was the first one and I, and I mentioned it as Spark structured streaming, um, which is just kind of the, the newer streaming, uh, SQL streaming module rather than the older streaming module. So that's what I use a lot. And I like that one a lot. Do you work with that one? A little bit. I've done a bit of that, but not, not a whole lot. I mean, just mostly out of work. Okay. Uh, to your question, especially since you spoke up now, to your question about Surti or Surti. So um, I'm not sure which slide it was, but Surti is like serializer or deserializer. And so um, a lot of times in the examples you'll do with these these frameworks and with Kafka, Kafka always, if you work with the Kafka APIs, um, they're, you're specifying, specifying a serializer and a deserializer for the messages and the keys, the body and the key of each message. And so string is kind of the go-to that um, you'll see in a lot of examples. And so you may not notice it. They just kind of say, oh, we're going to serialize this as a string, deserialize as a string, that kind of thing. Um, but really it's being sent as bytes over Kafka. And I'm not sure about every platform, but in Kafka, I'm sure it's sent as bytes. And you can do things like um, you can use Avro, send Avro messages, which are probably going to be a little bit lighter weight. You can manage a schema with them pretty well send those through Kafka, and then you're going to use an Avro deserializer. And so it gets important if you get away from just sending strings around. But if you're working with JSON and Kafka, usually you're just going to deserialize as a string and then parse it, parse it as text and, and do your thing with it. Does that cover yeah. what you're asking? Yeah, I posted. It. Thanks for explaining. Yeah, you're welcome. Hey, Dustin. Hey. Uh, which is your experience are deploying these Spark jobs with structured streaming because the only scenario that I saw are using uh, data rigs, but I'm not sure if it's easy to deploy like, uh, in, yeah, in, in another environment. Yeah, good question. So uh, I've certainly seen it done and done it on, on Databricks and um, and it wor works well there. I've, I've been a part of projects doing it on uh, AWS EMR and it works well there. I think there's a few settings you want to tweak if you're going to do it on EMR. They, they do like some EMR is kind of, um, EMR has some things that I believe are still set by default that are basically trying to like utilize as much resources as possible for, for each job, but it doesn't always end up working the best for your streaming jobs. And so what I found actually across environments with uh, Spark structured streaming, whether you're running on Yarn, running on um, Spark standalone cluster, wherever, or Databricks or EMR, is you're going to want to look at like your executors and your memory. Basically, you're going to look at these settings that you may get away with not worrying about for batch jobs and for small, um, you know, prototypes and things. Once you're going to run something all the time in productions, that's that streaming, especially if you mix in state. If you're doing joins or aggregations in, in Spark, then it's going to start to store state on you. You're going to want to look at the different settings of resources and 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 do a, do a little bit more digging into that. And so, um, always happy to to have uh, some conversations over chat or whatever about that because I've learned a little bit as I went. But it, it is kind of use case specific, and some of the ways you learn about it are pretty long blog posts and things gone wrong for people. So <laughs> I don't have a good summary of here's what you need to know. Um, but I've read quite a bit when things have not been going the way we wanted to on, on EMR especially. Okay, and what about the, the traceability? Because I think that one really awesome thing about the structured streaming using data rigs is that you can see all the logs about all the, the queries that are, are happening. Uh, 
how this work in, in ERR, for example? Yeah, so if it's not EMR, <laughs> if it's a Spark standalone cluster that you're running on your own, maybe on Kubernetes these days, uh, got it, uh, got somewhere it, got else, it. that Spark, str the structured streaming UI, which um, if you're doing structured streaming, hopefully you're using that one uh, in Databricks is really helpful. Um, but that's open source. Uh, and so you can get that other places um, for whatever reason. Uh, and please, someone help me out um, if I'm wrong on this. But with when you're looking at EMR, you got to do a little bit of um, proxying and weird things in order to access the UIs, uh, most of the UIs there. But even so, you basically get the, the Yarn history server has been my experience. And so you don't get quite as much visibility at the UI level. Um, but you can you can. What I do in EMR is I just log what I care about and then set up something else that's going to collect those logs and do some parsing and, and try and kind of build my own thing a little more. So yeah. monitoring structured streaming uh, and knowing that it's going well is challenging. It takes some time and effort. So um, that's the thing with streaming. I say you can probably build the job fairly easily if you've done some Spark. Keeping it going in production, um, it's going to take a little more learning. And I don't know if any of these frameworks I talked about is like, not a problem if you just throw it out there and everything's good. Kafka Connect, I'd say, especially if you run it on the cloud, probably not an issue. But uh, most of these where you're writing some real, you know, you're writing your own applications and deploying them, I think uh, you definitely want to look at how are we going to keep track of how everything's going, make sure we're not missing messages, that kind of thing. Yep, that seems consistent with my experience using EMR as well, uh, using weird things proxy in order to access just a basic UI. Uh, so we ended up using Databricks as well because it was getting harder and harder just to know if everything is running. Yeah, I'll say like, I certainly am not a, a salesperson for Databricks, but since I got to use it a lot, uh, starting like two two plus years ago, I've been like, oh yeah, it was probably worth the money when I was a, when I was kind of running a data engineering team and could have pushed for it, it was worth the money. I just didn't realize how much time it would have saved us that we were spending doing ops and trying to figure out stuff that Databricks just kind of does out of the box. But, but you know, the cost can add up if you're running things all the time, which streaming, you're running the cluster all the time. So it's definitely worth considering that side of the decision too. Any other input on the streaming options conversation? No one, oh, Aka streams, Aka streams I meant to put in my, uh, what do you call it? My like, contenders or honorable mention. Um, Akka streams, I think if you're going down the the Scala Akka pathway, Akka streams is worth a look. If you're not messing with Akka already, I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't push people that way, but um, I find it really interesting. It seems to do a lot of good stuff um, if you're in that kind of reactive Scala Akka environment. Any others? Any others people use and love or hate? I'll go. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you, Brian. What's up? Yeah, yeah. Long time uh, listener. I fell off the 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 yeah. video, COVID and whatnot. But um, but yeah, uh, shameless plug. I started a new gig at a startup that's in the data ETL uh, data lake space, primarily called Upsolver. Um, and so we're actually in a space competing with Databricks, competing with some of the data warehouse tools that. Um, uh, I've only been there a few months, so you know, take it for what it's worth. But um, if your team's lightweight and you're trying to grow fast, like we we've, we've got a lot of the some of the analytics on streaming data, uh, really well tailored in a SQL based editor, and it's fully cloud native. So, um, it, you know, I, I I helped deploy a customer uh, today with uh, Kinesis Stream to Athena uh, with some lookups and some joins and stuff. So it was all it was all uh, pretty straightforward and my background as an analyst not being a devops uh, guru in the data engineering space kind of uh, didn't 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 hold me back so um, just another option we're i think we're aggressively <laughs> bidding on keywords that compete with some of the stuff we've discussed so maybe you'll you'll come across it so if you go search streaming options you will find upsolver posts that are pretty helpful yeah and they had uh they had something out there that I, I think you guys have your own solution. I didn't quite understand how it fits in, but about uh the small file problem, I think specific to EMR and S3 and like yeah. a way to solve that without having to write your own code. So I, I read that article, kind of was like, all right, I'll stash that away for next time uh that becomes an issue. But yeah, cool, man. I didn't know you're over there. Yeah. And, and I didn't know they existed till this week when I was searching streaming, but cool. You got a lot of good content out there. 
Yeah, our founders are, were DBAs who um, were building an ad tech platform and they realized the data engineering challenges were sufficient in their own right. So they actually looked at to start licensing uh, the tool that they built for themselves. And that's kind of the, uh, the identity or the origin of the platform. And yeah, it's uh, the, the biggest challenge I think that we solve for is just what you said, Dustin, where you're writing streaming files to the data lake, uh, either S3 or blob storage. Uh, and you want to store them in like Parquet for optimized queries um, like Athena, but then as you continuously process new data, uh, you can't edit those Parquet files. So to continuously clean up and um, compact many small files into fewer optimized files um, as the partitions and the, the data sets grow, um, that's that's the, the problem we've solved, we think, pretty pretty elegantly. So happy to, to break out if you guys have more questions, but yeah. You'll, you'll probably find us organically. Cool. Well, welcome back to the group, Brian. Good to see you. Thanks. All right. I think we've hit a good spot. I've enjoyed the conversation. At least I encourage you to in the in the meetup uh, event and on our page, you should be able to see Slack if you want to jump in there and keep conversations going. You're always welcome to. Uh, I will announce what's happening next once we lock it in. You may have seen the chat, but. Uh, I'll wait till we get official stuff and I'll send something out about what we got happening next month. And yeah, and always feel free to reach out straight to me if you're not sure how to get a question out to the group or anything, but appreciate y'all being here, being part of the conversation and hope you got something out of it. Have a good evening. Thanks, Dustin. Yeah. Thanks, Dustin. Later. Thanks, Dustin.